pretty user interfaces, but to, we'll talk a little bit about layout and, and such, but the focus is on the programming aspects of it. Um, this has implications, um, you know, as you get into Android, there's some similar concepts with this as well, but I want to make sure we understand the, the pieces of this, how everything is, is laid out. And so we're going to go over a real, real, real simple example first, and then we'll build from there, as opposed to starting off with something complicated. But the simple example is good um, because it, it has all the parts. I mean, it's simple, but it has all the parts, if that makes sense. A lot of the more complex ones just, they don't have any new parts necessarily. They, there might be some new parts, but they just have a lot more of them, all right? Um, <laughs> I'm, sort of <coughs> I'm sort of babbling on and probably contradicting myself. And, uh, and so, so bottom line is we're going to start out with a simple example. Um, oh, I left my canvas open. I hope someone came in and did some grading for me while I was gone between my morning class and now. That would be nice. In fact, you're welcome to, because I have a class in here at 9 o'clock. You're welcome to come in between 10 and now and go and grade if you, if you want to. Even this class if you want to. I, I trust you. Um, all right. This is the time of the semester where um, I think students and uh, professors start to get a little overwhelmed. You know, I don't know like what it is in all your classes, but you know, I was doing okay until with grading until last week and then I sort of slipped behind. And, but I have a plan to catch up, so that's the good news. All right. Let me try and find what I'm looking for. Here we go, 12 and 13. All right, so I'm going to look at Okay, I got it. This didn't look right to me, but I think I got it squared away now. All right, we'll put this on the desktop. Extract it. And we're going to look at this first example. Oh, I'm going to look at it. You're going to just have to guess what I'm looking at. All right. So let's first run this just to show how it is and show how simple it is. So I'll go in and compile it. All right, who has French fries? <laughs> wow, those smell good. Where from? No, 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 I'm not, not going to take your food. Where are they from? No, no, that's okay, really. Where, where are they from? I mean, I, can you see me like lecture while I'm munching on fries? I, I don't know. That would certainly appear on the evaluation, I'm sure. From oh, McDonald's? Yeah, you see, I'm not really a fan of McDonald's, but I do have to admit they have good fries. All right. So I think example one and, and two here, if I'm not mistaken, do the same thing two different ways. So let's see. Okay, so I'm going to run first GUI, and we will see on the screen pop up a GUI. Yay. And it's my standard, what did I do in a lot of classes? I haven't done it this year for a while. I did this like almost every class like for, for years, and I don't know if I just got tired with it or what, but to convert temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit 
or actually we're doing the other way around. We're taking centigrade and converting it to Fahrenheit. And the formula is 9 fifths plus 32, I think. So that sounds about right. So if I enter in, we'll do the easy ones. Zero degrees centigrade is what? It's 32 degrees. So I click that, 30 is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Yay, it worked. Uh, 100 degrees centigrade is, should be 212. And negative 40, if my number is right, is negative 40. Those are my three test points to do. Those are the three I have memorized. Um, uh, now, if we type garbage in here, we get a, a message that says invalid input. It doesn't crash. All right. Um, this will definitely be the area, once we start getting in the realm of user input, the try-catch becomes critical. All right. The try-catch becomes critical because you don't know what people are going to put in. All right. And therefore, you want to be able to handle it. Um, another thing that would be important, um, we don't do it in this class, but you, you can do it in Java, is if you start talking about database interaction or talking to something outside of your program. You know, like you might be talking to a web service or something else where you don't know if there's some reason that you can't access it for at any particular point in time. You know, your internet's down or the database had crashed or someone changed the name of something. You know, if it's in your control, you know, it's in your control, but Sometimes applications talk to other applications that are outside of their control, and as a result, try-catches are really important in that situation as well. Okay, so we see what this does. Nothing earth-shattering, but it has all of the elements of a GUI. You know, it has some static stuff, like the label, has a text box, that you can enter data in, has a button, and that button forces some kind of interactivity. So you press the button, something happens, and something happens based on the value in the text box. So let's look at this code. And it's not hard, but there's definitely a couple of little tricky things that I want to make sure we have down before we go ahead with this. So let me open this up. First of all, everything's all in this one class. All right. So I'm going to edit with Notepad++. I import a couple of things, and these things are um, the, the elements that are needed to do uh, a GUI. The swing elements are the, are the things such as text box and so on. The action listener or action, uh, or action and action event are code that is used to handle the pressing of the button. Um, one thing that we, uh, that, that if you've done C-sharp programming, you've done something along these lines, but they may have like used different words and implemented it in a different way. I know like, um, you know, if you press a button, so you want certain code to happen, right, in C-sharp. And it's like that in web, you know, ASP.NET applications, or like that in desktop C-sharp applications. You press a button, you want something happens. There's a place for you to write the code. In Java, the place for you to write the code is an action listener. So for every, for every spot in your form where you have something that you want to use to trigger some code, you need an action listener. So how many action listeners do you think we need in this case? Very good. And what's, uh, what's the action listener on? On the button, on clicking of the button. Now, we interact with this, right? But no code gets executed when we're typing that in. If we were doing a Java Twitter application, or a Java Twitter-like application, you know, I, I don't know, any of you on Twitter? Um, if not, you, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, I really probably will need to bite my tongue over the next few years, all right? Um, 
but at any rate, um, you know in Twitter you're limited to 140 characters. So you can type in 140 characters and then you press the, 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 the button to say go ahead and, and send this out to the world. In Twitter, as you're typing, it counts down how many characters you have left. So if you type in hi, there's two characters, so you're down to 138. A space, you'd be down to 137, and so on down the line. So every time you type a character, a new thing gets added, um, and, and your, your countdown goes down. That would be a case of where I would have code associated with a text box, too, because I want some code to happen when I type something in. That would be, in, in, in a Java application, that would be another listener. So there'd be a listener for the button and a listener for the text box. And again, maybe this is obvious to you, but in this case, as I'm typing in, no code gets executed. No Java code gets executed. There's only one thing that triggers Java code being executed, and that's when I click the button. So therefore, I only have one action listener. Action and event are, uh, I will probably use them interchange interchangeably, all right? So, we need those action listeners and action event classes to be able to do that event processing. Now, notice what we have here. We have our public class, first GUI, that's the name of my class. It extends JFrame, and it implements action listener. All right? It's one line of code. We haven't even gotten in the code yet. This is just a, direct, uh, a directive at the, at the top of it. I guess it's code, but it's, it's not even really any processing code or anything. Let's make sure we understand what this means. Public class, first GUI. Okay, that should be obvious. It extends JFrame. What does that mean? It means it is a JFrame. Well, what's a JFrame? You could probably Google that and get a good answer. Better than I would give at the top of my head. A JFrame is I just saw a good definition somewhere. Okay, a frame is a top-level window with a title and a border. The size, blah, 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 blah. There is a special um, and, and the J frame, all right, adds to that, is a window that has decorations, border, title, and it supports buttons and so on. So essentially a JFrame is a, a top level window that your user, uh, that can contain, can be a frame for, you know, you think of a frame as containing things. It's going to be a top level window. It's going to be a frame that contains other Java GUI stuff. So in our case, as we run this, Our frame, it's a window, so therefore it has all the things that are window-ish about it. We can close it, we can maximize it, we can minimize it. We have a little icon here that shows up on the taskbar. Um, and it contains our GUI stuff. So that's what a J frame is. So mine, my first GUI, extends J frame. All right. Well, what does that mean? It extends JFrame. Well, it is a JFrame. Right? That's what it means. And therefore, everything about a JFrame that we can do, we can do to our class. And we can do other stuff, too. So we don't need to worry about coding the window close, the, the, the button to close, or the X to close a window, and to minimize and maximize, right? That, I guess, by virtue of being a window. We just have to code what's specific to our window. 
And what's specific to our window? Well, our label, our text box, our button, and our label to show the results. Now, here's where it gets tricky. So far, I, I would expect that would be pretty easy to understand. Our page, or our, 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 uh, our class, is a window. All right? Every application, by the way, has, every GUI application, by the way, has to have at least one JFrame in it. All right? We've obviously seen applications that didn't have any, right? But, but they didn't have a GUI at all. All right? Now, we said it implements Action Listener, too. All right? Action Listener is therefore what? Well, it is going to be used to click, the, to click the button. You're correct there. But in terms of is it a class or is it something else? It's an interface. And we know that by virtue of the fact that we say we implement that interface. Now, we talked about crazy things like an, when we say an interface, it, 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 you, we'd say it's kind of a weak is a. It sort of is, you know. Another way to phrase the word interface is that it can serve in the role of blank. So, what does that mean in this case? Well, let's think back to our email example last week. We had students, we had faculty, and we had vendors. All of them could serve in the role of an email recipient. All of those might be an entity that receives an email. So all of those serve in the role of email recipient. So in other words, all of those implement the email recipient interface. So what does this mean here? That, th that my class implements the action listener. Well, it can serve in the role of an action listener. So, Put simply, if I'm going to put this in layman's terms, or as close to layman's terms as possible, my class here contains both the GUI elements and it contains the code to process those GUI elements. All right? That's what these two things mean up here. It extends JFrame, so it's going to contain GUI elements. And it implements action listener, which means it serves in the role of an action listener. And what do action listeners do? Well, they listen for, all right, they respond to user actions or user events. So, in other words, all my code for the GUI and for the code to process the GUI is contained in this one class. That's what that means, all right? It doesn't have to be this way. And we'll see other ways of doing this, all right? But this is one way that we can do it. We can have this. Now, tip off here. What about this program, what about this particular uh, JFrame makes it easy to make this both the GUI and the code to handle the GUI? Something unique about this, or not unique, but there's something distinct about this that lends itself to just doing everything in one class anyhow. Well, because it's so simple, right? Specifically, what about it is simple that makes it a, probably a good idea to, have, to make this the action listener as well? You're raising one finger, and, and it is your index finger for those of you who can't see. What, uh, one what? It's only got one button. It only has one button. So there's only one event that we're worried about writing code for. All right? That lends itself then that we can put everything all in one place. If we had a more complicated form that had a bunch of buttons on it, we probably still could do it, but that would muddy the waters quite a bit, and it probably wouldn't be such a good idea. But the fact that this is so simple, and what I mean by simple is not necessarily just the number of form controls on it, but more so the amount of code that we have and the amount of events that are going to trigger code. We only have one of them. We only have that button. And therefore, we can make this guy do everything. So, it's the window, and it's the code that handles the user interaction. Like, 
certs, two mints and one, or like Reese's, chocolate and peanut butter, does two things. All right. So, here are the attributes. You can see a mistake right here. These shouldn't be public. All right, it probably should be protected or private or whatever, but we'll forgive that. What are these things? Well, you can almost guess. These are the different GUI controls on here. So GUI controls are attributes in the frame, right? That makes sense, right? What does this frame consist of? Well, it has a label, it has a text box, it has a button, and it has another label. Well, looky here. It has a label, it has a text field, which is the text box, it has a button, and it has another label. Now, notice what this has. Our constructor, we pass different parameters to it. All right. J label, we pass a, a parameter of enter temperature in centigrade. So that's used to initialize the value of the label. Text field, we indicate four. That means more or less, this is four characters wide. Now, unfortunately, that's not precise, right? Because not all characters take the same amount of space. You know, uh, uh, a one only takes, so that's going to be approximate. But that's a sense of how big the size of it is. And that doesn't even keep you from putting more stuff in it. I mean, I could type a bunch of stuff in it. It's just that that relates to the physical size of that text box. Yeah, I had to go do that now, huh? Command A. Command, we're not on an Apple. Control A. <laughs> All right. Convert, well, that's the label on the button. And finally, our results label contains spaces. In other words, before we've done a calculation, it's empty. All right. So these create the four GUI controls that we have. All right. These, are, these will initialize these objects to be these four GUI controls. Now, here's something that's a little confusing. All right. Right now, those GUI controls, I mean, these are floating out in space. We have to go and actually add them to the window. All right? So in other words, just because you declare a form control as an attribute doesn't mean it automatically gets added to the window. You could think about it this way. Um, Let's say you are, let's say you are, are doing, um, let's say you, you, you are doing a registration for a website that has both uh, United States and Canadian customers. You could have a drop down, which we don't have an example of a drop down here, but there are drop downs in the swing components. You could have a drop down for United States and you could have a drop down for Canadian provinces. You won't necessarily add both of those to your window right away. You could declare them as attributes, but when the user made a selection of, I'm a United States citizen, I'm a Canadian citizen, then you could choose which drop down you want to appear. All right? So, or like, you know, are you married? And you answer yes, an extra box pops up for your spouse. You know, you could have it where that box is up uh, all the time, but. You might make a cleaner user interface by just only showing the fields that you need to show. Um, is bill to the same as ship to? If you answer um, yes, then you only have one set of fields. If you answer no, it shows you a second field for the ship to, second set of fields for the ship to. So there's a lot of cases where you can build a GUI, but not want all the controls up there right off the bat. Now again, this is about as simple an example as you can get, the one that we're currently working on. So yeah, all four of these are going to get added right away. Now, here's a part that 
I have to say the first time I saw it was a little confusing. Maybe it won't be confusing to you. All right? This has a main method. All right? This has a main method. Notice what that main method does. It only does one thing. It makes an instance of itself. All right? How can that even happen? How can an object make an instance of an object? Well, remember, this is a static method. So we do not require an object. What this is saying is, when this runs, the main event will get hit, the main method will get hit. The first thing it does is create an instance of itself, so it will make a first GUI object out on the heap. All right? And what will that do? Well, what does any object do when you execute new? It will call the constructor. All right? It will call the constructor. And right here below is the constructor. All right. Now, let's look at this. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave this line for last. So we're going to forget about that line for now. We're going to look at the other lines. All right. And let's rewind. When were we going to hit this code? Well, I compile this. I type in Java first GUI. Anytime I just type in Java first GUI, what does that do? That executes the main method in that class. Here's the main method. All right? It's a static method. It doesn't need a class to do that. I can just execute it. All right? What does this say? First GUI. New first GUI. So it's going to make a instance of this class. So it's actually going to make a J frame. Until this is executed, we don't actually have that frame yet. We're just executing a static code. All right? This is actually going to go and make a first GUI object. And anytime you say new first GUI, what does that mean? That means call the constructor. That's how it's been for since the first, first few days of the class. We say new something, that means call the constructor on this class. And so that will call this, because that's the constructor. How do I know it's a constructor? Well, the name matches the name of the class. So that's how you know it's a constructor. All right. Remember, we're going to skip this one, but we're going to do everything else. This set visible true. It makes it visible. All right. Set default close operation, JFrame exit on close. What that does is that says what happens when you click this guy. What Java commands happen. And essentially it's just, it's just going to close down. When you click that, it's going to close down the window. All right? That's all that really does. JPanel P equals new JPanel. All right? You think of a frame. I'm going to sketch a frame. This will be, this will be art, art 101. Let's say this is my picture frame. All right. Normally, like, well, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not. But normally, if I was going to put things inside the frame, there'd be sort of a backing here. I wouldn't, like, just try to put the picture in the frame without there being, like, a backing. I would attach, like, let's say I want to put three pictures in this frame. There'd be, like, a cardboard backing, and I could glue the one thing here, glue one thing here, glue one thing here. And I put those things in the frame. I put them in the frame, yes, but I first put them on a panel within that frame. All right? So it's a similar thing with these J-frames. These J-frames can contain a panel. 
all right? And the panel is sort of like the main thing that is in the frame. So if I was going to do this, I was, if I was going to put a collage of three pictures inside a frame, let's say this is my frame. I might take a panel and glue the three pictures on them. Then, boom, I would put my panel within the frame if I was going to frame a picture. And I hope this isn't the stupid ana stupidest analogy you've heard today. All right? That's sort of what the panel serves in this case. You don't put things directly into the frame. You put things on a panel. And then you put the panel in the frame. So the panel is sort of like a subcontainer. Um, you could actually put a couple of panels on the, uh, in the frame. So I could like split that and have two panels and put some things on one panel, some things on another, and put it in. This will become more important when we start, about, when we start talking about arranging things on the, on the, the page. Because notice this has a real straightforward layout. Right? Everything's just laid out in a line, horizontally. All right? So I'm not going to put things directly into the frame. I'm going to put things on a, onto a panel, and then I'm going to put the panel into the frame. All right? This is a line we said we're going to ignore. These things are putting in our panel, we're putting on our panel, our GUI controls. What is LBL temp, TXT temp, BTN convert, and label results? Those are the things that we declared as attributes up here. So when this is created, these guys get set, these guys get defined, and now we're adding to them, we're adding them to the panel that we just created. Excuse me. Then, what are we doing? We're adding that panel to the frame. And then finally, we're setting the size of the frame. So, if I was going to comment this, Make visible. How to close. Create a panel to put all our GUI controls. Put panel in the frame. Set size of panel. It's a real good activity to go and comment my examples. All right? Go in and this example's out there, but to go through and see if you can duplicate these comments so that you understand what's going on. So, when we run this application, let's, let's follow through, let's play computer, all right? We'll bounce back and forth between the, the Elmo and the screen. So I compile it and it works. I type in Java first GUI. What gets called? The main method gets called. What, the main, what does the main method do? It creates a new one of these and it calls the constructor. So we've created a first GUI object and we've called the constructor. I'm going to use this represent 
this to represent the frame. So what's the first thing we do? We make the frame visible. Frame is visible. All right. Next thing we do, we tell it how to close. Okay. Well, we tell it what to do when they click the little X up here. All right. That's kind of just general housekeeping. Nothing earth shattering there. We create a new panel. Because we're not going to put things directly into the page or into the frame. We're going to put things into the panel. So I will represent that with this sheet of paper. I'll fold it because it's going to fit inside the frame. All right. So I've created a panel. If we were to stop time and look at the window right now, look at the J-frame right now, would we see the panel inside the J-frame? No, because we haven't put it there yet. All we have done is we have created the J-panel. That J-panel is floating in space, if you will, along with these other things. All right? There exists somewhere, oh, perfect. Does anyone have, oh, we have a stapler, perfect. Enter temp, text box, button that says convert, and the results. We have these things along with the panel that are floating in memory. All right? If we were to look at that window right now, we wouldn't see the panel. We wouldn't see any of these things. Because they exist. They've been created. They're living out in memory. But we haven't put them on the page yet. All right? So, we're going to forget this line for now. First thing we're doing is we're going to add label for temp to the panel. And I knew there would be no staples in this. All right. I'll just write enter temp. And we'll pretend that that's that same label. All right. So enter temp is now there. Add the text box for temp. So the text box for temp gets added. Add the button. So the button gets added. Finally, add the results to the panel. And we add the results. So at this point in the code, if we were to look at the J frame, what would we see? We would still wouldn't see anything. Because we've created everything on the panel, but we have not put the panel inside the frame. So at this point, this panel and all these objects are out in memory, but they're not associated with that window. Keep in mind, in a more, you know, we might not be ready to put this on here yet. You know, we might want to put this on at some later time. You know, we don't know. In a simple example like this, yeah, we're going to put it on right away. But in other cases, we might not want to put this on right away. All right? At any rate, we have this panel sitting out there waiting. This statement here says to go and add this panel that was in memory to the content area of the frame. And boom. Now, those GUI elements are contained within the frame. 
And as a last thing, we set the size of it. So imagine the, the frame changing size to be whatever we set it to be. All right? So that, in a nutshell, is what the, this does from here to here. It happens in the constructor, right? Because in the constructor, you should have the GUI controls in your GUI, right? Again, thinking of a simple GUI like this, where there's no like swapping out of things or anything like that. But in a simple GUI, yeah. When you construct a page, you're going to take your GUI controls and add them to something, in our case, a panel. Then you're going to add that panel to the frame. So when you're done with this, we have our, we have our GUI looking the way that it should. All right. Any questions about that? Why did it organize them this way? That's the default. If you don't specify, um, if you don't specify, notice we didn't say anything. You don't, it didn't look like there's any code anywhere that said, put these horizontally, put them vertically, whatever. So by default, it put them in that way, just arranged horizontally. So that's why it looks this way. Now again, obviously this wouldn't work for a complicated GUI, you know, something that had, you know, 50 different fields to enter in. We're not going to have a line of 50 fields uh, going across. All right, but for our purposes it works, so we're going to start slow. Questions about any of this code other than this line? So right now, we have the visual part of our GUI done. Now we're going to talk about this line. You know, 80% of the lecture is, is talking about the GUI, and the other 80% of the lecture is going to be talking about the event listener. All right? What does this do? Well, remember, whatever you have, something that the user can interact with, you have to say who's going to interact, who's going to handle that interaction. Where is the code going to live? to handle that interaction. And that's exactly what this does. We are adding an action listener. What is an action listener? It's a class that listens for events and then does something in response to those events. All right. So what object is going to handle it? This object. Well, what object? Well, this object our JFrame object that we just created and just added all those things to. That's literally what this means. That our JFrame object not only contains the GUI stuff, it is also going to contain the code that handles when the user interacts with the window. And again, since the user can only interact with it one way that triggers code, that is by clicking the button, that's sufficient. Now, can I make any class? Could I put any object in here? Could I put a pizza object back from our example weeks ago in here? Could a pizza handle the clicking of a button? Uh, such a bizarre question. Could a student, could a professor, could a course? What kind of objects do you think I can put as an argument to this function. What kind of objects do you think could be action listeners? I'll, I'll give you a hint. No, we couldn't. As, as we wrote the code currently, we could not make our pizza object an action listener, or our student object, or any of those other objects. Why not? Why can we make this object an action listener where we couldn't make those other objects? Action listener. Pardon me? Ah, the second one is correct. What kind of classes we can put in there? Any of them that implements the action listener class. If, a, if our pizza implemented the action listener class, then of course we could put pizza in there too. All right? But this is the first example we've seen this semester of a class that implements the action listener. 
Because what does implement action listener mean? It means it can serve in the role of an action listener. Serve in the role. Just like uh, our students implement the email recipient, means a student can serve in the role of an email recipient. So, I can put any class in here, or any object in here, provided it implements the action listener interface. Now, what does it mean when we, declare, when we define that something implements an interface? What have we promised the compiler? We promise the compiler something when we implement an interface. When we implemented the email recipient interface, for example, on the faculty member, what did we have to do? We promised the compiler we were going to do something. We, pardon me? Well, not necessarily it has its own constructor. It probably did, but that's not really what makes it um, belonging to that interface. Yes? Okay, that's very true. Um, okay. It, okay. Uh, okay. You're right. Um, you're right. Let's see if we can add to that. Obviously, each object will be treated the same. So, and what made us able to treat students, faculties, and vendors the same? Yes. They all had to have a certain method inside the code. They had to have all the methods that were declared inside the interface. And this gets to your statement about having different things in it, the code to do this. So in order to implement the action listener interface, you need one method, action performed. All right? So if I take this out, let's say I spell this wrong. I spell with two N's. It's going to complain because I've broken my promise to the compiler. I've said that this implements Action Listener. Action Listener has an action performed event on it. Anyone that says they're going to be an Action Listener has to implement that method. And that's exactly the method where the code that will live. Now the code in here is real straightforward. I take the value of the text box, that's what this means. I turn it into a double. I then use it in a formula. And I put the answer in the label. That's wrapped in a try-catch block because if I put something that isn't a double in there, it's going to throw an exception. So I catch that exception and display that in the results instead. So what are the ingredients of this? We're going to, implement, we're going to extend JFrame and we're going to implement, in this example, we extended JFrame, which means it's going to be a container that we can put GUI stuff in it. We implement the action listener. It means the code that's going to handle the clicking of the button is going to live here. We have instant variable, instance variables for all of our GUI elements. Our main event simply makes a new instance of this class. The constructor sets a few properties of this window. Makes it visible, says what to do when you close it, creates a panel, puts all the GUI things on the panel, puts the panel in the window, sets the size of it. It also defines that this, this object itself is going to be handling the button clicking. We set the button, add action listener, to this, ob this, this object itself, which means that the code needs to be in this object. What does the code need to be? It needs to be in a method called action performed, because that's a method that's defined in action listener. 
And when we promise that we're implementing the action listener inter interface, we're promising that we're going to have that method. So, we'll revisit this on Wednesday. In the meantime, take a look at this code and study it, and we'll come back to it. All right. And then we'll do it a different way. And again, we don't do things different ways to confuse you. All right. I did have a student ask me that in one of my classes. Why do you show three different ways to do something? Just show us one and we'll be done with it. And it's like, well, in different situations. And I, I mean, I can appreciate that for someone that's first coming into this. And the, the real answer is, in different situations, you might want to take one approach or another. And over time, you'll learn that. So we'll get this down first, and then we'll look at the different approaches that we can take. All right. We will see you in lab.